Greetings, this is Rick Ward from Your Journey Transitions. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, aging and your pet. And I've got a guest here, a good friend of mine, uh, Andrew Beatty. Uh, he's a world-class dog judger and knows everything about pets and animals. And so we're going to look at uh, some of the common factors uh, between people and dogs. Uh, aging and uh, things that we can do to prepare ourselves as well as preparing our dogs uh, as we transition through the retirement stages. Uh, Andrew's been my go-to guy for uh, dog advice and my chickens. Uh, he's been uh, uh, an expert on, on human behaviors. Uh, Andrew and I have worked together in the disability field and mental health field for over 25 years. And so he has a unique perspective of uh, onto people as well as pets, and so it makes him a really good guest to speak with today. So uh, we'll get Andrew's insights into uh, uh, pets and aging and some of the things that we need to consider. Uh, what I do like about Andrew's point of planning, planning's crucial. That's the whole point of this channel is. Uh, the more we plan, the less drama there is uh, for the people we leave behind and for ourselves, and in this case for our pets, uh, how we can reduce that uh, as we change and they change. Uh, so let's uh, join that conversation now between Andrew and I, and uh, I hope you enjoy it. So today, I have the pleasure of having my long-term friend, Andrew here, who is my go-to guy when it comes to animals, for the pets, particularly my dog and my chickens. And so, uh, we'll just have a bit of chat with Andrew. We talk about different issues to uh, be facing as our dog ages, and the issues that face us uh, in later years having pets. So to start off, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, Andrew, and how you come about, what your experience with animals is? I'm 56 years old. I can't remember a day that I haven't shared my life with an animal of some form. Dogs, cows, guinea pigs, racing pigeons, dogs, the old cat, thanks to my wife. Uh, but you know, any animal, I'm lucky I wasn't brought up in America because looking at their pet shops I probably would have got bit, stung or eaten by something what they provided. The Australian pet shops or the English pet shops weren't quite up to that class of the amount of animals you can get. But yeah, I was lucky enough to be involved in a family that showed dogs. Uh, I took that up and been lucky enough to qualify as an all breeds judge and judge around the world. Um, uh, breeds that I'm mainly interested are, are Borzois, Russian Wolfhounds and Whippets. And I'm fortunate enough to still have some of those in my backyard. And I still show dogs with my parents. Although it feels like age care for me, we all still go to a dog show and have fun. So what's that like uh, going supporting your, your parents, because they've been involved in dog showing as well through a lot of years, isn't it? So the issue is nowadays, I seem to be doing a lot more of the lifting, like we've got a tent, we've got chairs, we've got dogs, we've got dog trailers, and I've got a dual cab ute, and I'm figuring I might need a bus with the collection they're getting, and they're getting a few more dogs. Dad now shows a Scotty, because it's more at his pace, and Mum's got whippets, but lucky enough, they live about 10 minutes away, so... It's a bit of a magical roundabout tour when I start to go to a dog show, get all the gear, go pick them up, take them to the dog show, do what you've got to do there, come back and drop them all off on the way home. And I don't get an aged care pension for that, so I need to work on that <laughs> down the track. But, you know, the issue you've got is that you have a look at those two people, mum and dad, and the issues they have with being heavily involved in animals and now having to wind it back a bit and take care of themselves. The other day mum was telling me a story, she was out the backyard, just a suburban backyard with her two whippets. They run her over. Basically she fell over and falls are not good. So basically had to have a chat about that, you know, she should stand by the wall or the door or make sure the dog can't run into you. And let's face it, falls with the aging are uh, a risk, a severe risk. She was lucky she came out with a couple of scratches. In dad's case, the dog's company. Uh, he has issues with his present wife and um, so the dog keeps him company. When I go there at 9 o'clock in the morning, he's usually out walking his Scotty, and during that walk he gets to socialise and talk to other people, all important. I suppose the thing you've got to look at is the care of the dogs. As you get older, I mean, unfortunately we tend to end up in places like hospital or care homes or we're looking after the grandchildren or whatever. 
I think we've got to consider that when preparing our dog. Is your dog going to be transported? Is it used to going in the car? Is it used to maybe spending a bit of time in the appropriate size cage? So that takes practice. You train dogs to go in cages, sleep on specific beds and be transported. It's not just chuck them on, we'll go on a happy holiday for a week and wonder why the dog's being sick everywhere and rather stressed and making a lot of noise. It's all about preparation. The same is if you know that you've got an illness or you're unwell, spending time training, having a look at where your dog's going to stay. Is it going to stay at home? Have you got someone that's going to come around and feed it? Do they know what to feed it? Have you a list on the wall? Yeah, I like the same things for breakfast. Our dogs are pretty similar. Have consistent feeding regimes, but tell somebody, have some notes, so the impact on their life, it'll be bad enough when you're not there for a couple of days or a week. The dog will be stressed, but keeping their life or routine the same is important, and people tend to forget that. Also, if you're going to a boarding kennel, get to know the boarding kennel people, have a chat to them, but make sure, you know, we've got computers, you can email what they usually have, because they may get a call to come and pick your dog up. And it would be good if they've met your dog before, so it reduces the stress factor on them. I suppose the other thing is you've got to look at, or put, you forget things, so maybe having some sort of checklist where you've got somebody checking on you that you are feeding the dog right. I mean, these days, some people in Asia don't like driving, you've got mobile vets to come out, and maybe developing a relationship with somebody like that would be a good thing to come out, for them to come and see you. Get to know your animal. Know when it's in good condition. Know when it's maybe losing a bit of condition and stuff like that. So the basics are you look after yourself but if you're going to have a pet you've got to figure out how to look after them when you're aging as well because as a result, like when we've got young families life changes as you age, your routines, your habits, some of the things you control obviously become less but you can help the support and manage and keep your animal happy when maybe you're not there for a while or keeping the routines the same and I think that's where a lot of people struggle. I mean, if you have a look at the other thing, is that you've, some of the dogs you've had for 15, 10, 12, depending on what breed of dog you've got, they're living that long, they're living a good life. But again, the dog's a bit like us. They tend to slow down, they tend to get a bit sore, they tend to feel the cold, they tend to feel the heat. So prepare for that. There's nothing worse. I remember a while ago, I was living in a house and this guy was yelling out. I went out and it was a very hot day, 40 degrees in Perth, and he was walking the dog at 11.30 in the day. The dog had passed out. So we got some water, but basically, he shouldn't have been walking the dog at that time. It's too hot. Be aware of the surroundings. Be aware that when the dog's young, it can do anything. Just like us, when we were young, we were immortal. Dogs probably think the same, but we've got to take some, maybe not walk so far. The other thing that people do is they tend to try and feed it the same thing. We have different needs, protein levels, size of kibble, touch like buying a big bone. Maybe the old dog can't get through, but it can get through some fleshy stuff. So you've got to look at what you're buying, types of food. Again, keep up in contact with your vet, somebody looking at your dog, because then you know when it's losing condition. It's probably, it might be feeling the cold, so if it lives outside, maybe you get a rug to cover it up, or you change the boxes in. If it's inside, just keep an eye on it. The other thing is the heat. I mean, a lot of people walk dogs, like I said, at the wrong time of day, or they walk it on cement or bitumen roads. The reflected heat for men. I don't like walking on when it's hot, and I like dog wood. The other thing you've got to consider with that is looking at having a look at what else your dog is doing. Is it sleeping more? Uh, yeah. The whole thing of just knowing your dog. And also do research. We're pretty lucky. We can hop on Google and we can look up anything these days. So don't be afraid to look up and don't be afraid to ask the questions. It gives you something to do. But yeah, feeding, maintenance. And be aware your dog is like us. It's aging. So things, and it forgets things. You find a lot of older dogs are not so friendly with the other dogs in the park. Maybe they can't see or can't hear as well, so it's threatening. They protect themselves by growling or biting, or they may just be trying to protect you. So be aware of it. When those changes come, make changes to what you do, walking the dog at quieter times, being aware, having the dog a little bit better controlled, maybe not running loose as much if that's an issue, and things like that. I like the idea about visiting kennels before, getting ready, because it's much like us if we're going to go into aged care, I know with my father-in-law, having a bit of respite beforehand. He got to know the people at the respite. He didn't want to go in, but he went in there. And so when he actually had to go into care, uh, he already knew, he was familiar with the place, he was familiar with some of the staff. It made that transition a little bit easier. So I think that's a really good idea. Um, I suppose if you're younger and more active and you're going on your holidays and you have your dog, you can't take him with you, then uh, the kennel stays. But have a relationship with the kennel. I like that idea of going out, 
much like picking out a nursing home, go see a few different kennels, see who you like, uh, take the dog along and see how they react with your dog and how your dog reacts with them. Little short stays to start with, maybe a few bit longer ones. Yeah. Uh, it's always, I guess it's always preferable to have uh, family members or something like that, but not everyone's going to be able to, to look after exactly. your dog. And you never know, the, the kids might be able to look at them now, but when it actually happened, when you went to hospital, that might not be a convenient yeah. time. So if there was some experience, I really like that idea. And the other thing with the vets, I mean, is it necessary to have health checks for vets? Uh, if you do, how often or well, I suppose, is a problem? Man, mm -hmm. I suppose it's the, you, you, to get in boarding counts, they usually want you to have yearly shots. So there's your opportunity. Yearly dog? Yeah, yearly, yearly shots. Shot. Especially when a dog's older, they've got more likelihood of something coming down. Especially things like kennel cough and that, keep an eye how often you shot, keep an eye on the dog. If you get a regular vet, they know your dog. So you might bring a year later a dog and say, oh, maybe its skin's a bit more tighter, the coat's not looking as good, or there's discharge from its eyes and stuff like that. And the vet knows your dog. But if you just take a dog in cold, it's relying on you. Well, you're the best information, but sometimes we get older, we forget a few things. Mm. And to us, she looks fine. They come by and say, oh, your dog's overweight. I go, oh, she's lost weight. She looks fine to me. <laughs> but somebody, and that was the thing that we've done. It's in one of my other videos. Uh, seven steps to 40 again we're walking the dog and the exercise we're doing exercise dogs doing exercise it's all good but i can't she doesn't do the mindful eating and people still feed her yep. so that weight gain i don't know if there's any way we can control that because she'll out here we're real property she goes to the neighbors and people feed her well, you're pretty lucky the dog's got, got a lot of space to enjoy his life i think the issue with i mean just keep an eye on it i mean the thing is i mean we all hop on scales ourselves who puts a dog in a scale and you're lucky you can pick your dog up but I didn't realize how heavy she was. So I went to give her a bath last night, and usually my wife does that, and I picked her up, and she's like 20 kilos. So. That's exactly right. So she's probably a little bit overweight, but you mean we all, all put on a bit of beef as we get older. So. But the idea is being aware. I suppose the biggest sign is that when you get really fat dogs, and your dog's pretty active. Some dogs aren't active. You see them sitting around, and then they walk across the shed and back in their puppet. So there's a sign there. And I mean, that's what you've got to be aware of. And different breeds. I mean, some of the large breeds live seven to 10 years. I mean, so you're looking down the barrel fairly easy. But some of the other dogs are living to 15, 17 years and looking pretty good for the last few. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden they start to get arthritis or their eyesight goes. I mean, you usually tell when their eyesight goes, they start doing things differently. I'm amazed that when you go to somebody's house, not, I mean, I've had a look after my dad's dogs and they give you a rough overview of what they feed them. But you know, when you actually go there and nobody's there, it's interesting how much information I actually didn't take on. And I've had a little list, I give them you know, half a scoop of kibble and some of these meatballs or whatever they give them. So it's consistent. Dogs like us, they like routine. And, you know, and when they get older, it's making sure, you know, um, what size kibble, is it tough kibble to eat? Is it, are they struggling a little bit? Are we giving them big bones, we're probably better giving them a bit more fleshy bones, so it's a little bit easier for them. Mm -hmm. And there's good products out there, you know, there's, there's good dog food out there. So you just gotta find what they like and what works for them. When you say there's good dog food out there, so is it a matter of the preference, what they like to eat? And you just go watch them. I mean, the point of the good thing is also you've got a lot of reviews. You've got a lot of professional societies giving reviews of dog food. I mean, there's good expensive ones and there's good cheap ones, as far as cheap as you can buy from the supermarket. And the other thing is you've got to have a look at the results. I mean, the dog's coming outside and basically you've got the runs. It's not a dog food no, we no. use. That, that, I mean, we all talk about the old tin food doing that. Well, none of us want that result. You want to get a balance. Well, that's the, the way I've told the past. If they got diarrhea or something, yeah. like it's obvious. Yeah. Because uh, she has a tip. Now, what about a lot of people, including myself and other people, will feed them food scraps and things like that from your own human food? Um, the, uh, look, uh, um, look, the dogs like it. I mean, it's always that. I mean, some people, some traditional breeders go, they shouldn't do this and shouldn't do that. Basically, the only thing I can see you've got to be careful with is, you know, is have a look at the brittle bones, especially with older dogs. They're not breaking them down. I mean, I've, I never feed my dogs, you know, cooked chicken bones because they get brittle. You know, and of course, you, you get down the stomach, little dog. That's the only thing. I mean, I'm fussy on what scraps I do. I always sort them out. Oh, I'm pretty lucky. I've got a wife that knows what I'm like. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, so anything with small bones or whatever, if it's not a big bone and it's cooked, it ain't going to my dog. So the cooking is it because it makes it. Yeah, real. Raw bones, I never have a hassle with. And raw food, although more people have issues with raw food, people have more issues with raw food than dogs. Mm. And that's, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's great books written on feeding them awful. I mean, people don't like to buy awful because it goes quick, but they do pretty well though. But it's, again, getting that balance. I mean, some people go, oh, what have you cooked the food and stuff like that? 
The dog usually lets you know. If it likes it and it's not starving, it, it, it'll eat anything. I mean, you know, I've, I've had dogs that, you know, like Vegemite and toast. Loved it in the morning. I've seen dogs eat Vegemite yeah, yeah, they like it. I've seen dogs eat curry after a couple of goes and come back for it. You know, you put curry in, oops, and all of a sudden you can see it sort of sweating, and all of a sudden you put it out, it's into it. I mean, is it bad for it? Well, there's nothing if we can eat it, they can eat it. I mean, there's certain things like onions and stuff like that you've got to be careful with, you don't give it to them. But you've just got to be careful. It's like ants, sort it out. If you're going to give ants and scraps, sort out the good scraps. People chuck the whole lot in. Well, the whole lot might not. If you've got small bones, well, let's face it, we don't like little bones either. No, no, I get caught in that. The uh, Maddie will eat anything put down in front of her except for carrots. And if you give her a, a soup or something, and she'll pick out, and the only thing left in there is going to be carrots. Well, interesting she was as much the old boys talking about give them carrots, grated carrot, and stop them. If you have a dog that happy eats its own droppings, putting carrot in the food stops them doing it. They reckon. Really? Yeah. I don't think we can get her to eat carrot. I don't know why. It's that's the but only she thing. Drop, so you will good anyway. Yeah, but she'll eat anything but carrots. But but she'll eat as, and if we go to someone's house, if they got dog food, we got to put it up. She will eat everything in the bowl. Um, yeah, well, that's probably so why she's a little can, bit showy. Well, we can control here because of how much we yeah. give her. And, but, uh, yeah, she other people will feed her and she'll eat anything given to her. But she's doing much better. We exercise every day yeah. and she's lost some weight. Totally. And her coat's looking good. It's got a nice shine to it. And that's something you look at. I mean, you see some dogs, the cats, the coat's a bit all over the place. It's part of it. hasn't got a shine. Usually that's a sign of things like that. It's like us. You know, people who are well the hair looks good, same as dogs. I mean, you just look at the, the coat looks good. You're pretty lucky she's got a nice length of coat, so that's easy to manage. Except she sheds everywhere. I wanted yeah. a short-haired dog, so it doesn't shed, but she sheds yeah, well, terribly. So that's because you didn't do your research, that short-haired dog. My wife and son went out shopping and come back with a dog. Well, that seems to be the common problem. <laughs> us, us purebred dog breeders said, do some research, make sure they've got all the checks done. And that's one of the issues they've got mm-hmm. these days is that people complain about purebred dogs. Or, the issue is at least get somebody who's done the checks. If you've got breeze and have issues with hip dysplasia or other concerns, find someone who's done the checks. Then you've got a, a better chance of getting a dog that's going to last you longer and healthier. And that's the issue. I mean, you don't want a poor dog you bought and three or four years old, it's dragging itself around. Because the future isn't good. Do you think there's, with, let's start with uh, our just retiring, we're that 55, 65. Is there a breed of dog that works good for that? And is there some dog, breed of dog that's good for the 75 plus? I think I think it's like, um, is there a particular woman we like to look at? I think we're going to look at if it, if it likes you and you like it and there's a reason you want it, there's a greater chance you'll look after it better. Sometimes people, I mean, some, I look at some people's dogs and I wouldn't have them. I have little dogs that bark a lot, no way. I just don't like the barking, so that's me. But people, some people love the terriers. You take it for a walk, they're into the bush, they might chase the odd cat, which may or may not be a good thing, but them kind of things go on. I mean, I think you've got to look at it when you get older. I think, um, are you physically able to walk some of the giant breeds or get out of their way? Like we talked about the falls before, mm. that's my concern. And easy care. I think, you know, it's, if, unless you've got to pay for someone to come and groom some of your smaller dogs with large coats, they're not that easy to look after as far as their coat. There's a lot of work. And I don't see the point of buying a coated dog if you're going to shave it off. Mm. It seems to contradict what it's about, but that's just me. Yeah, no, I, I find that quite strange to me by the breed. I like a small dog, because I've always liked a dog that's on my lap, watch TV, get a stroke, and de-stress yeah. type thing. And I worry about the big dogs knocking over little kids. But then again, i got to start thinking about knocking me over. If Nothing I get right. my balance, it starts to be an issue. I think because I was brought up with dogs, and my kids are little, because I've got the balls always were too bigger, is the issue was when they brought friends around, why well, we said lock the dogs away. My dogs, I haven't got an inside dog for various reasons, but I mean, the issue you've got to look at that, but you know, you've got to plan what you're doing. I mean, the biggest thing that worries me with kids is when you hear kids squeal when they're playing, it sounds like an animal being killed when you've been out of it. And I've seen dogs change at that time, that worries me. Because dogs get excited, especially younger dogs. The old dogs have probably got used to it and they know how to move themselves away. Dogs are playing with the kids. I've had a kid touch me and one of my dogs who didn't do anything growl at them. To protect me. Mm. So, I mean, there's interaction with kids, you've got to be, especially not only your own kids, but other kids coming to visit, which is completely normal how you manage your animals then. And I think you've got to be careful when you've got people who are aging who spend 
a lot of the time with their dog, they might, you know, their partner may have passed, and they, the dog's very protective. Mm. You watch how many little dogs die in front of the rain when you come to the door and check it all out. I mean, my dad's got a Scotty. I mean, it's good, but I mean, the issue is it's on his old. As it gets older, that'll probably change. But the issue is he's got to be aware when someone comes to the door, check it out, put the dog outside, and then invite the person in. Because there's nothing worse than somebody getting nipped by a dog. Mm. Both people. The person has an issue and the poor dog has an issue. And he's probably trying to do what he thinks is right. That's my, my issue with Maddie. She's changed with the dogs. She gets a bit protective or whatever. Um, and she's always been good with dogs and little kids. She's still good with little kids, but I'm really concerned since she's changed with the dogs that she might change with little kids. And I, my grandkids are very small and there'll be more of them coming. Well, we, had, we had a family whip. I think she was about 14. My son was probably five or six. And she used to lie in a beanbag, so he kept running in the lounge room, jumped on the beanbag on top, but that's the only time she ever nipped the kid. Couldn't really blame her, but it's still not a good outcome. These things happen. And you've got to, I mean, you've got to prepare a little bit. I think people forget the dogs have instincts and you've got to, the, you know, the fight and flight thing, the fight things bite. And the, be, the be, best biters I've seen are nervous dogs. Mm. Not, yeah, because they bite out of reflex. That's always, I've only been bit by small dogs, I've never been bit by a big one. So I got bit yeah. selling insurance, that's probably fair. Oh, yes. <laughs> that's all reasonable. Well, that's, I like the idea that the kind of little checklist to begin preparing yourself. I'm going to add that to, I think, your transition planning is for your pet, the type of food, bedding, favorite toys, whatever. So you have something like that ready and prepared because you never know when you're going to fall over and well, it's interesting. break a hip or something. And I, race, we, I was in a city where race greyhounds. People don't like some of the race and greyhound habits or whatever. We, we had fun. The kennel, we, the guy who trained it for us, I mean, when the dog come to the kennels, because they kennel them at the racetrack before, all these dogs are coming in with all their beds to put in the kennel, because they spend time in the kennel before they go out for the race. All these different shows. I'm watching going, all these beds are coming in. So obviously, again, they were preparing their dog. The dog liked its bed. You have a calm dog, read a rock and roll a race, as we would, away it went. And, well, they complain about these people, but I'll tell you what, they had some good beds coming in there. Good. I guess that's one of the questions you can be asking your kennel when you're going around. Could you bring your own bed in? Or oh, yeah. Because I'm sure some would have, no, this is all of our stuff. It's yeah. hygienically sealed or whatever. And other ones would probably be all right. And Just the other thing is that was the thing in boarding kennels is all of a sudden you're in a very noisy atmosphere. And that's not the boarding kennel's fault because a lot of dogs, they're, they're stressed, they're anxious. Um, the dog getting used to that is hard for some dogs. Because one of my friends run boarding kennels and, you know, it's different, different dogs. You have to look at them and assess them. But have a chat what kind of kennels they got a separate sleeping area where you know it's a little bit quieter or whatever but, and also if they know you're feeding you and like i said you might be called to the hospital tonight are you ready to somebody to ring the boarding kennel and say come and pick up your dog i mean we found that out with our clients we've worked in the past yeah. they've had a dog and get swooped up to hospital straight away and we don't know if the dog's locked in if it's got any water uh, exactly. Who's got a key to the house? That's uh, exactly right. And so, yeah, having a plan beforehand just in case, uh, and leaving that uh, plan with somebody. Yeah, got. and how you I mean most people keep their dog food, their dry dog food, usually in, in the bottom shelf of the pantry. So have a little note in the pantry drawer of what you feed it, what the go is, or whatever. Mm. But the other problem is that the things that happens when you leave, you get rushed out. The dog's pushed outside or left inside. It isn't a happy camper. Mm. So if you can reduce that stress by you know, when you do go away and visit people, leaving it for that few hours, getting it used to it. But also, I'm a big believer now in training your dog to get used to sleeping in a crate from time to time. So transport and moving, it's a lot easier. I mean, I've got a, a dog that's used to a crate. Uh, I wash them for a show. I can leave them in a the crate for an hour or so while they're drying. I can also put it in a show at the crate. It sits in there. It's its crate. It's its blanket. It's its bed. It doesn't get stressed. Well, you know, you wander around, you don't get used to crate, you turn up, you put it into this crate it's not used to. It hasn't been crate trained, as in, you know, sometimes it's stressful. Sometimes it's stressful. I mean, when you're preparing dogs to fly, you're always crate trained. So and no how would you do that? Would you have the crate in their pen or in the house? or well, with puppies, to it? well, puppies, have a look at the size of dog you've got to have and buy a crate big enough for that dog. So, you know, a crate that they can spin around in, it's got, you know, 10 inches above its head and stuff like that. But put its bed in there. Start it off by it going in there and coming out of there when you get it. Now these plastic crates are pretty light, easy to clean. 
you can take the door off and leave it off for a little while but slowly introduce the door and things like that and then you've got options when you transport that crate can usually go in the back of your car unless it's a bores or the crate's too big for your car but you dog like yours i mean so tra- and then when you go somewhere different say you stay at a friend's place and you want to bring the dog you can say look the dog can go in the crate that's good as long as i give it a run do this business come back in at night it sleeps in the crate there's no problem what else do we have with the factors for the aging or general things about dogs so you mentioned the uh, their eyes get the blue tinge that's a chance how yeah. do you know about hearing it just hearing i mean you can do the old trick of standing behind him and clap your hands and see if they, they respond you'll start to see certain things i mean dogs a lot of dogs people they start doing things differently they might turn their head more to one side you'll notice that it might be i mean dogs get infections of the ears hardly anyone checks their ears especially if you've got breeds like cocker spaniels and that they've got hair down their ears you've got more issues with that and you should be aware of that when you get that breed there seems to be some treatments you're doing regularly again doing your research on the breed before yep. you buy it or even yep. if you've already got one someone's given you a puppy yep. get on there and research what are some of the health issues and stuff you might Most have like the that. old aussie farmer who wants to come back to his suburban house and have his australian cattle dog or his kelpie i mean cattle dogs uh you know temperament can be a mixed bag and kelpies they like to run around for a while so i mean you've got to address what size backyard have you got um how old's the dog are you going to be able to walk it stuff like that and be honest with yourself mm. i mean we'll slow down what can you do i find it amazing talking about greyhounds uh, friends of ours have got greyhounds and they spend most of their time laying around you take them out to a park you throw the ball around they do it for a bit but they are, their dog is pretty low you think being a racing dog they'd want to be running all the time well these years it's one of those fallacies isn't it? when you watch Attenborough show, you don't see the lions running around all the time. They sit there until they're ready. Yeah. And let's face it, you know, dog does a couple of laps, has a bit of a play, usually wants to sleep after. That's They go hunt, eat, sleep. They don't run around all day. I think some of them African dogs do some interesting kilometres, but basically they're hungry. Mm. They're looking for food. Well, your dog's pretty well fed. And yeah, you know, if it gets an exercise, it gets interaction. I think the biggest problem you've got is, is you know, you're going to be at home with that dog as your age, you're no longer working, so if your dog's going to be look. you're there, it's going to sit the door, it's inside with you. It's changed, because when you were working or whatever, you probably weren't there for eight hours or ten hours of the day, you were gone. What does it do then? Wait, l- lays around waiting for you. That is the number one reason why I think dogs make excellent pets. That regardless of the day of what's happening, my dog whimpers and loves to see me when I come home. I could be gone 20 minutes and come back. Uh, you don't get that with any person or any other creature. That just always well, some of us get it when people, some of us don't. Oh. <laughs> Maybe she light up to see you every time. You're exactly right. I light up most of the time when I see you, Andrew, but not every time. <laughs> but that's it. I mean, that's the good thing about dogs. I mean, and yeah, you've just got to be... The biggest problem is if, whether you're aging or a dog aging, there's plans for both sides. And I think it's about planning, preparing, being honest with yourself and looking at your dog and saying, how old are you? Hallelujah. That's my message is planning. Because yeah. the last thing we want is dealing with crisis, having to put fires out. It's stressful for you. It's yeah. stressful for the animal. It's stressful for whoever's been taking it. They're not prepared. So again, the more preparation we do, the better it is for everyone. And you love your animal and you want to have at least amount of stress uh, exactly right yeah. and the, the routine i mean you, people change dogs uh, sometimes i'll look at you go down a park and you see some little dog come up and there's 10 dogs running around and somebody lets their, their dog out and all of a sudden they wonder why there's conflict but dogs work on dominance there's always a dominant dog if you've got a pack so a, a dominance isn't the greatest politest thing in the world they might never go at your dog so I know when I used to walk my dogs, if there was too many around, I went a different direction. Mm. And when you're old and you walk your dog, you don't want to be pulled over. You also want to have a look at the equipment. What kind of lead have you got? Can you control the dog? Can you really hold the dog? And stuff like that. And I mean, you see a lot of people walk with these lovely coloured leads that are woven, lovely fabric, maybe got a little bit of gold hanging off them. Are they any good for walking your dog? They look lovely hanging up. Yeah. And I like the, I guess you can watch YouTube videos and stuff for different things. I like the harness. We've got a lady down the road that walks her dog, and that's the only one. Maddie's found her piece with yeah. all the other neighborhood dogs. They've worked it out between them. 
but this dog's always on a leash and it's a small dog but it still pulls on her she's probably late 60s yeah um and it's always trying to defend yeah. her and that's it but maddie and her just do not get on but she's got a chest harness so when maddie's was on the loose now that i keep on now i walk with the leash i only put it on when i see her yeah and i put it on but she's able to pick that dog up with yeah. the harness you know and if you would have done that with a collar you know, you do some damage to the dog. And the other thing was, you know, what, uh, you know I've seen people with whippets and greyhounds have the collars around their neck. Well, they've got narrow heads. It doesn't take a lot of pulling for mm. that collar to disappear straight down the, and the dog's gone that way. You've got the lead. It looks good. <laughs> so, yeah, the harness is good. And to work out what's a good fit and all that, again, we probably have YouTube videos that would show you how to, to fit one. Yeah, that's it. I mean, you should go have a look at that. I mean, and talk about the variety of dogs. Go and have a look at them. Go check them out. What do you want a dog to do for you? I mean, and you look at some of the old, older people, what they've come from, the dogs they've had before. I mean, how many families have you seen have generations of Labradors? Because mm. they love them. Yeah. That's great. And he, but is a Labrador too big for you at the end of the day? That's another thing. But Labradors, you mean, Golden Retrievers, there's a whole pile of different breeds that you can look at. But the other thing I recommend is, when you're looking at getting a dog, check the parenthood checked it's had all its shots and checked it had its checks i mean issues some of these dogs have got issues that need to be genetically tested before they're sold you mean health checks yeah yeah no, no, physical checks i mean the issues you get blood tests and, and bone scans i mean you get some that hd what numbers are hd clear hip dysplasia clear if you're getting a german shepherd you want that mm. and you got dogs with eye diseases make sure you know what diseases the breed have got so when you go to buy one have they been checked for that if not, don't buy it. Mm. It's it's a lot of issues. And I always find it interesting, these designer dogs. Well, I haven't heard these designer dogs don't get them. But I haven't heard many designer dogs get the checks. So, if you, whatever dog you get, get the checks. Mm. I suppose the interesting thing, when we used to buy dogs, we used to go in the country and buy a dog. They worked them. So, unfortunately, the working sorted them out. You wouldn't have had dogs with many issues that were working. Either on the farm, hunting or doing the gun dog thing so the people that use them you, you probably check out their fitness to survive whereas these days we can breed dog a to dog b dog a doesn't get off its bum and dog b's got issues but we can breed them and sell them they still look lovely pups i see that there's like those french bulldogs yep. or whatever they're very popular but they've been bred in a way they've all kinds of health issues that's it you're gonna have a look and then on the other side you get some lines of french bulldogs that people have worked hard to get a dog that's basically fit mm. it doesn't get it still has and they still get them but not as much so you can test for that you can take yeah. them to the vet to yeah yeah they, they a yeah. certain tests and certain breeds have that are, are to be tested i mean you get some dogs that have what they call a blue merle color well, they get things like spina bifida as a result of the merling in their genes so all sorts of stuff like that happens and you've just got to say what is this dog being tested and if you can see the parents sometimes it's hard to see both parents because sometimes in this day and age you might have used a dog from somewhere else or they are using artificial insemination stuff like that but have a look at how the, the mother is you usually get this the mother's usually there. have a look have a look at the other dogs there if there's other pups have a look at them they all look good are their coats good are their eyes good have they had the shots they look happy start off with the basics but if you're paying, and let's face it, dogs aren't cheap anymore. No, I mean, even for your mixed breeds at the at the uh, pet shop, you yeah. know, like seven hundred thousand dollars you pay yeah. for these dogs. Yeah, that's it. I mean, you've got, I mean, you've got a lot of breeds that are getting rarer and rarer, and as restrictions get more and more, uh, these dogs are going to get rarer and rarer, and going to cost you more. I mean, my dad's got a Scotty, bred a Scotty, and we uh, put that in, and we had like twenty five emails. They just can't get them. I mean, because of their issues, obviously they've got issues as well. With, you know, sometimes they struggle with the size of the head or whatever, so there's birthing issues. Yeah, it's finding find the dog that suits you, but, you know, it's finding that out. But go and have a look and think about what the dog is going to do for you. But that's it. I mean, you, and, yeah, there's you know, good dogs in all breeds. I mean, I think where people get lost in it. I mean, you look at you look at, you look at some of the, the the bloodhounds and that. I mean, there's a lot of stuff with them, and some people love them. If they love them, it's all good. So, it's, again, because they got shorter lifespan. Yep. And if you come across any experience of what's the best way to handle that transition, and oftentimes people get a young pup, and the older one raises it, or is it better to have a break between dogs, or is, 
I think that's very individual. I don't think that's very individual. I think the issue is we, because I've shown dogs, we've probably had too many dogs to be honest. The uh, issue you've got to look at is, yeah, some people introduce a young pup as the dog's getting older. I mean, personally, I'd find that stressful for the dog because you've mm. just changed its whole environment. But that's more for you than the dog, I think. And mm. if you need that, that's reasonable. Yeah, some, some old dogs cope with that all right, some don't. So maybe there's some issues of exploring around that. People who've chosen not or didn't have kids, or the fact that we're much older and we don't see our kids or grandkids very often, so the dog becomes our center focus yeah. of our attention, and then the grieving that goes on when you pass on. So how does it, is it going to ease that grieving if you have another dog, or it's better to deal with that? I guess it's quite individual. That's it. I think, as you know, death or whatever for anybody, your belief system is a whole individual thing. Mm. And there's no right answer, I think, to that one. But if you do do it, is again, prepare. If you're going to introduce a new dog into the family, into the other dog's life, how are you going to do it? And how do you think there would be good ways of doing that? I think, well, the issue, again, again, I go back to if you train your dog to a routine, you get the, your younger dog into a similar routine, introduce them slowly, make sure that you've got control so the older dog can't, like, yeah, be aggressive towards the younger one or well, the younger one can't jump all over the older dog all day mm. I mean you imagine how you'd feel yeah, yeah. It's just planning it and it's just like, I, mean, I think the secret is letting them be able to see each other and control get together times and that increases do that slowly yeah, yeah because yeah. I think the risk are if you're, if you're not there watching them there's going to be some sort of sort out in the system and that yeah. can create issues but if you I've found that dogs that see each other are happy. They can see the other dog, they're right. If they can't see him and hear him, that doesn't work. But if you have a system, I mean, the old thing about having areas where the old dog can go, maybe the old dog's not used to the crate, the puppy's getting used to his crate. So you face the crates together well, at night where they get used to each other. No, I've seen that at your place where that, yeah. just that reassurance yeah. that they can see each yeah. other. Yeah. And that's it. I mean, that's it. It's working on a, just have a plan. I mean, the issue is. And don't try and chuck the pup in the old dog's crate. In the old dog's bed. Oh, territorial thing? Yeah, well, it should be. Mm. Well, I hope you uh, enjoyed those insights of Andrew's. Some, put some of that planning in place for yourself uh, to plan for wherever you are in your journey. Uh, getting yourself prepared and your pet prepared for uh, changes as we transition through retirement. Uh, out of this video we'll probably make a lot of smaller videos uh, about more succinct points. Andrew has a, a good overview of a lot of uh, things to do with your pets and aging and I might make some more specific videos around some of the key points that uh, Andrew brought up. Uh, feel free to uh, make comments below of what parts that you actually enjoyed, uh, things that you'd like to know more of and I'll be happy to make some videos around those specific areas. If you're new to this channel, I would uh, encourage you to hit subscribe. On the bottom of the video is a watermark, so subscribe. Just hover over the top of that and another button comes up, so subscribe. You subscribe to that. If you want to make sure you don't miss any further videos, whenever videos are released, uh, hit the little bell, which is a notification bell, and then you'll know whenever I release a new video. You can also follow me on my Facebook page as well as my Instagram, Your Journey Transitions, and LinkedIn, as well as Twitter, Your Journey Transitions, and you can always follow me through my website, yourjourneytransitions.com. So until next time, this is Rick Ward, your guide to the retirement years, wishing you an extraordinary retirement. Cocoon. What comes out of a cocoon? Butterflies. Are butterflies beautiful? Yes. Yeah.